Hello, this is Mark McClellan. Hello, this is Mark McClellan. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. I'm going to be moderating. Our topic today is improving care management and care delivery through better use of data analytics. Uh, this is a topic that many of our ACLC members have uh, uh, had a lot of interest in, uh, given all of the investments and all of the information, even all of the hype around uh, how analytics can help support the effective implementation of accountable care, uh, given its uh, our role as one of our core competency areas. Uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion today. We're going to have the opportunity to hear from Adam Gale, who's the president of CLASS Research. For CLASS, for those of you who don't know, is a health information technology research firm. Uh, also, Bradley Hunter, the Research Director on Population Health uh, at CLASS is joining, is joining us. Uh, and CLASS is not your typical uh, consultant um, uh, uh, health IT advisor. And, uh, it's rather a, 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 an organization that works with thousands of health professionals and clinicians, uh, really about gathering data and insights on how uh, to use different types of software and services medical equipment related to uh, data and analytics to deliver timely reports and trends and, and overviews as part of the support of effective implementation of accountable care. And so I think you'll hear in their presentation, um, they are really focused on supporting providers in these big challenges of uh, uh, improving uh, care and how providers can best uh, select and then work with IT vendors, analytic vendors to improve performance. So we're looking forward to the discussion today, and uh, I hope uh, you all be ready with uh, questions or follow-up since we'll have some time for that too. Uh, before I get started on that, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, just like always, to minimize fee feedback, please keep your phone line muted when you're not speaking. If you're using both a phone and a computer, uh, we'd encourage you to dial in first and then uh, use your computer, uh, on your computer, select the connect via audio option when the window pops up and then mute your phone. So you'll be on the, the phone muted, but you'll be able to see the, the presentation. Uh, hopefully many of you are already doing that. Uh, there, as I said, there will be opportunities for questions. Uh, there is a question box on the Zoom window that, uh, that you're connected through. Send those in at any time and we'll get to them in the, the, the course of the, uh, uh, in the course of the webinar. Um, uh, we're planning on covering uh, um, a few other things today uh, um, with respect to the uh, uh, um, a few updates with respect to the, the ACLC, um, and then uh, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on the political landscape. I think the, the short summary is that uh, uh, not a lot of uh, major new developments yet, uh, but also not a lot of big changes in direction either uh, from the new administration with respect to uh, the payment reform agenda and support for accountable care. Uh, then we're going to hear the uh, presentation from Adam and Bradley and some time for questions. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we have a few more events upcoming. Uh, there will be another webinar on May 10th. Uh, we'll have more information on that, um, the final details forthcoming in our weekly uh, email update. So uh, please keep an eye out for that. Uh, there are a number of work group calls taking place in April. Uh, related to our work on competencies and uh, the glide path for developing and implementing them. Uh, those invites should be out. Uh, if you think you should be involved in one or more of those calls and don't feel like you've been, uh, you have got the information you need, please do connect with Daniel Chipping uh, about that. Uh, and it's still a ways off, but we did want to make sure you put on your calendar our fall ACLC member meeting. Uh, we are doing this in Washington, D.C., and it will be in conjunction with the uh, ACO, uh, with the National Association of ACOs uh, uh, meeting as well. I know some of you all participate in that effort, too. Uh, so some opportunities for uh, some additional uh, content and, and learning and sharing information about policy development uh, at that upcoming meeting in Washington. So please do uh, put that on your, on your calendar. Um, let me just spend a couple minutes before introduce, introducing our speakers with just a, a brief policy update. Uh, as you've probably been uh, uh, reading in the news, the uh, um, Washington um, policy focus in, in healthcare has been on the repeal and replace effort, where we are kind of at a stalemate, a standstill with uh, 
uh, Republicans, at least so far, unable to put to go, together a, um, a workable bill that can get enough support from the uh, Republican Party and Democrats uh, um, still very unified in opposition, um, feeling like the Republican proposals would have too much impact on uh, the effective uh, um, uh, on uh, reaching the effects of uh, intended effects of uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act in terms of access to coverage and uh, uh, and the Medicaid expansion. Um, I think that uh, debate is going to go on for a while longer. You've probably seen in the news uh, even today, for example, uh, some of the um, uh, Republicans in the House, including the House Freedom Caucus, uh, believing that we're getting closer to uh, uh, closer to uh, a deal that Republicans could support. Uh, that's still going to be challenging. I remember that um, many of the um, Republicans are concerned about the coverage impact that have been estimated so far from the uh, uh, existing proposals, and those are going to be hard to fix with just a, a couple of tweaks. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the, I think the, the Democratic opposition is going to remain uh, pretty unified. Uh, what this does highlight, though, is the fact that it is very hard to do coverage expansions with broad support and improve access to care or with health care costs as high as they are. And that gets back to why there's continuing bipartisan interest in um, many of the activities related to payment reform and a focus on value that uh, you all are working on as part of the uh, Accountable Care Learning Collaborative, and more importantly, as, as part of uh, all your, your day jobs and work uh, uh, on uh, health care reform in your institution. Um, the new administration has um, asked for comment on some of the uh, more aggressive mandatory payment reforms that we're carrying over from the last administration, which is really the uh, episode payment model for the cardiac care and for uh, um, a hip fracture. Uh, it's possible that that will result in a, a movement in the direction. Uh, but in terms of uh, continuing expansion in uh, accountable care organization programs, or like the Next Generation ACO, uh, in terms of uh, additional programs for physician payment, uh, like uh, those that uh, will be implemented as part of the uh, uh, macro legislation, uh, still a lot of interest there. And we're expecting to provide more of an update on some of our upcoming webinars uh, as uh, the, the new administration's policy priorities become clear. Uh, but again, what is clear in the meantime is that this uh, uh, push uh, pressure, both from uh, the federal government, but also states that are now even more interested in finding ways to keeping costs down um, while preserving access, uh, and the private sector uh, are continuing their uh, activities as well. So we'll, we'll keep you apprised of new developments uh, uh, there. Uh, what I'd like to do for today, though, is, is turn to uh, the uh, both the importance and the challenges of using health analytics tools to support um, the, the goals of accountable care transformation. And, uh, as I mentioned, we've got uh, two uh, uh, people who have been leading on efforts to help healthcare providers identify and work effectively with vendors and tools that can support these goals. Uh, let me first introduce Adam Gale as one of the original four class founders. Adam oversees all health IT uh, research and performance reporting at CLASS. He's worked with hundreds of healthcare professionals along with executives of all of the major health information technology vendors. We're going to hear a bit about uh, those different vendors during his presentation and consultants over the lifetime of CLASS. Uh, Adam's research focus has been on core clinical and financial systems, including ambulatory electronic medical records and practice management uh, tools. Uh, Adam is a, a HIM fellow with 20 years of healthcare experience, and he's spoken at conferences around the country, including uh, the recent HIMS uh, national meeting where we had our uh, uh, our um, ACL city uh, meeting in conjunction earlier this year. He's a graduate of Brigham Young in business and information systems, and he resides in uh, Orem, Utah. Uh, Bradley Hunter, who's also joining us, uh, originally from Calgary, Canada. He came to the United States to escape the uh, uh, cold Canadian temperatures and uh, I guess to get some experience with uh, more extensive health care. Um, so uh, whether he's on the golf course or reading charts to his uh, twin uh, one-year-old uh, uh, children, Bradley enjoys telling everyone uh, 
all he knows about population health and how it is revolutionizing healthcare. So you'll get a, a, a dose of that today. He currently works as a research director over population health at CLASS and has been in that role for more than two years. Uh, Bradley's background includes an MBA from, from Notre Dame and a, and a, a BF in business from Brigham Young. So I'm going to turn over to, uh, to, to you two, uh, Adam and, Br and Bradley. Hopefully you all can hear me okay. And I hope you'll, uh, in addition to launching the seminar, give us a little bit of background on, on class and the, the, the mission of the company. And Adam, Bradley, if you all are there, great. Yep. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yep, I, we're here and uh, hoping that uh, you can see my slides here. And if not, you'll uh, you'll just get to close your eyes and imagine the charts that we have in here as we go. Uh, I, I thought we might kick off with sort of my fifth grade rendition of what I did on my summer vacation. Uh, only this year, this time being uh, what I learned at HIMSS 2017. And as I thought back to it, this is I think my 20th HIMSS meeting and, and it's pretty amazing. Every year at HIMSS, you could almost walk away with what the theme was for HIMSS. And, uh, and I don't know if it's just me and the discussions that I have, but every year it feels fairly clear. There was a year of, of interoperability and there was a year of population health and a year of security. And, uh, and the funny thing is we hit all these topics for a year and, uh, and kind of assume that we can move on as if, you know, hitting it for one year, we've, we've pretty much gotten things solved. So I, I thought I would just hit what I learned and what, what my takeaway was from HIMSS uh, 2017, mostly because it ties directly to this topic. And, uh, and I had a lot of discussions with folks around how to improve analytics and what's happening in the analytics world and, and how it impacts everything from, from you know, care at the, at the bedside to, to interoperability to population health, all, all of the things that tie into analytics. And, and as you well know, in, analytics is woven into everything. But uh, I was amazed that many, many of my discussions end up turning to the topic uh, ch or changing from BI to, uh, to AI. And, and I, I don't know, first off, I just chuckled and said, okay, if you can't get BI right, let's just shift it to AI and, and we'll slowly move down the alphabet. Um, but the I is next. The I, yeah, we'll start at the end and then move to the beginning. It, uh, you, you know, it kicked off with with IBM doing a uh, the the keynote discussion with a lot of discussion around AI. Uh, discussions of of every application should have AI in it in the next few years. Just a lot of discussion around AI, and uh, probably no surprise to you when I would stop and ask the people that were having those discussions what AI was. There was uh, a lot of fumbling and lack of clarity around what it was, and certainly some folks had a better grasp on it than others. But, but just broadly as a topic, as it came up, it was it was clearly something where there's a lot of uh, hope and interest, but we're we're just at the very beginning. And and part of what I want to talk about today is getting back to some of the basics that I think will even help us as AI comes out. But uh, but just. As a research firm, we always love to validate what's real. So there was a press release that came out a few months ago about a health system that was doing some AI with a, a vendor out in the market. So I, I know the CIO there really well. I thought this will be a great opportunity for me to really understand AI and, and what the benefits are. So I called up this individual on the phone, said, hey, I, I was pleased to see the, the press release. I thought it was really interesting what you're jumping into. Can you take a minute with me and just share, you know, what you've done, what you've found, what, what the progress is? And, uh, and it, it was startling. I could almost see that, uh, that individual blushing over the phone as they said, well, you know, we, we are very enthusiastic about it. We haven't actually done anything yet. So, so hopefully what we talk about today is about things that are actually being done. I know there are some have been some great webinars recently on fun things that are going to happen with AI, but uh, our goal today is to stick with um, what we've found for success in the analytics and BI world. And uh, and again, don't get me wrong, I think we will be able to do cool things with AI, but uh, let's just not get ahead of ourselves yet um, and, and assume that we've uh, we've already conquered sort of the basic BI. So with that, let me jump in. 
with uh, how how you how we might think about this. And and you would think that class as a company that measures healthcare tools would open up with this. That look, the most important part is a great tool set. Then you need to have great analysts that can dig into the data, that know how to use the tool sets, that can can uh, you know help clean up the data when when it's messy and help get to uh, some some ways to, to govern the data. And then you need a few change agents that can help apply those those changes in the market. Um, I just want to tell you that we see it in the exact opposite way. Um, the most important part of analytics that we've seen over thousands and thousands of interviews and and 20 years of working on this is the most important piece is having great change agents. And that is both a combination of people in your health system that know how to take data and, and have it move the organization. And two, it's just a culture of being hungry for that kind of data. And uh, secondary to that is having great bright analysts who can, who can drill into the data. And then lastly is the tool set. So, uh, so in kind of an ironic beginning, uh, I'm kicking off by telling you how little these tool sets matter, um, and then we'll get into how good the tool sets are. Well, and, and a good point with that, Adam, is that if you have great change agents and great analysts, if you have mediocre tools, they're going to tell you right away because they're not going to be able to get what they want. So it, it makes a lot of sense to say that you need to have the, the right people before you can have the great tools. Yeah, in fact, and I guess one of the ironies, uh, the tool sets will be fine and absolutely adequate if you have mediocre analysts and mediocre change agents, then whatever tool sets you have will, will probably be okay. But as soon as you do have very strong people and a culture of change, um, you will find that a number of these tool sets won't map to what you're trying to do. So part of our goal today will be to walk through which tool sets seem to be the best in, in which uh, scenarios and based on what you're trying to do. So. So we'll jump in with, uh, with a couple of quotes that I found very interesting. And the first is from a site that's been incredibly successful, walks through a specific project they were working on. Um, they've counted the number of lives that have been saved, and they couldn't be happier with the tools and the partner that they've chosen to do this. Uh, the second quote is from a chief data officer who is, is on the very much the flip side. They, they uh, would like to choke their vendor. They've had huge issues. They felt like they were, were ready to move on a heavy-duty analytics project. And the fact that the, the actual product that they purchased wasn't ready, they felt like they had to rewrite the, the code, essentially, with their vendor, uh, really slowed down the progress that they were trying to make. So, so the question is, how do you get to one versus the other? Both of these are incredibly bright organizations, they have a culture of learning and moving forward, and, and how do you avoid the traps that are out there on analytics where, where every vendor says they have analytics, and that's from uh, the EMRs, the big analytics vendors, the small niche vendors in any category, all will say that they have analytic capabilities. So it's easy to get, uh, I don't know, to get skeptical when someone says, hey, we have analytic capabilities. So, so let me jump in one of the key questions that we've asked in the last couple of years, and that is how, what percent of the time or what percent of customers say that they're getting extensive insight from the business intelligence or analytics product that they purchase? And, and I'd like to give you just uh, 15 seconds to look at this and see what pops off the page to you because there's three things to me that just sort of, uh, I don't know, huge flags waving in the air that I, that I take away from this. And, uh, and I'm curious if they map to what you take away as you look at this. Uh, the first is just the challenge of what I'll call the, the big box tool sets. So the four vendors that have gotten the least amount of extensive insights are all uh, cross industry, big uh, tool sets that are kind of choose your own adventure type of tool sets. And uh, if you look at IBM there, uh, that is the Cognos product that they acquired several years ago and not the population health tools that they've acquired. So we'll, we'll have a discussion in a few minutes around the specific, the healthcare specific population health tools that are available out there. But these are the broad, again, cross industry tool sets. And those are the ones where 
on average, you have 15% or so of those big box tool sets, 15% of those sites saying they've gained extensive insight from their, from their vendors. Uh, the second thing that, that pops out to me is two vendors that essentially are uh, twins in Mipex that are the visual data discovery. And that those are the click and tableau, both, which are right by each other near the, near the top. Um, organizations are finding mass adoption of these products um, and, and oftentimes in non-coordinated ways, meaning people get the tools, they have a natural gravitation to, to get the data that they need. People are, are finding as they renew at the end of each year that they're using way more licenses than they ever expected, which let's say is a good thing. People are fi finally getting to some of that value that they had been pitched for years but had been slow in coming. Now the challenge with, with some of these vendors with Click and Tableau are that you have a lot of data governance issues in the background that could be glossed over. And, uh, and I know a number of these organizations have fairly good data governance in place, but I've run into a few that uh, you know, they very much come to meetings with different data in hand and uh, realize pretty quickly, okay, with so many people having these tool sets in hand, they need to tighten up their data governance. However, it feels like it's been a great catalyst for movement. So, so a lot of success with Click and Tableau. And then if you look at the high end, those, those organizations that are seeing the most insight are, are from SAS and from Health Catalyst. And, uh, and so the question pops up there, and, and we'll talk about this more as we go today, what in the world is happening there that creates such a different experience on, on the analytics front? And let me hit SAS for a minute first, because they're probably the biggest outlier here. Uh, SAS is often used in a little bit different way in these health systems. Um, and oftentimes those are by just incredibly smart biostatisticians to solve some very specific products. So I don't think from that focused use, it's a, it's a surprise that they would have over half their customers that, uh, that say it's been, they've gotten great insights. Um, on the health catalyst side, I'd say their, their success maps a little bit more to what a normal health system, if you will, is trying to do. And in this case, the health catalyst tool is secondary to the guidance of how to get where you want to go. So uh, not to say that they don't have a great tool, but the tool is very much secondary to picking a destination and, and working to get there. So. So with that as a background, um, the question would come up, okay, if you have an, on average 30% of customers that feel like they're getting extensive insights from their BI tool that oftentimes they spend quite a bit of money on, what does it look like in terms of them wanting to stay with the vendors that they have? So if you look at that on our next slide, we've asked all of these customers, are you planning to stay with the vendor that you have? And I will let this soak in for just a minute um, to see if you, you come away with the same thing I have, uh, that I come away with, which is uh, if, you, if I ask you, hey, do you like the restaurant that you go to for lunch? And uh, let us, you would have a great sense that all those people would be going to different restaurants the next week for lunch. In this case, it's almost exactly the opposite. People feel like they're not getting what they need from their business intelligence and analytics solutions. They're not getting where they want to be, but they are almost across the board planning to stay with whoever they've chosen as their analytics vendor. And, and there's a few things happening here. One of those is they've obviously made a big investment typically to, to load up a data warehouse, to clean up the data, to set up some governance. There's been a lot of work put in for the, for the feeds of the data, so you, so you do have some, uh, I, I will say, just investment that's happened already. But I do not believe that is the key reason that, that people are not moving. And why do, what do we think the key reason is for people not moving? We call it here in class the New York syndrome. And I'm, I'm guessing this isn't one that you've probably read about in the papers. If you live in New York, no, it is not a disease that we're talking about. Um, how class sees the New York syndrome is this. Um, it's as if providers each bought a car and they each picked a different car for a different reason. Some of these are maybe Maseratis and some are Hondas and some are 
uh, BMWs, they're all purchased for different reasons. And the question is asked, we want to get to New York and we haven't made it there. So as we talk to these providers who have not yet made it to New York, they say to us, it's not my car's fault that I've never been to New York. So think about that for a minute. They have a destination. They very much want to get there. They say they haven't arrived and it's not the tool's fault that they haven't been able to get there. So what is, what is the reason? What is the driver behind uh, the fact that they haven't gotten there? I would say it literally is the driver. So a number of these health systems we talk to say, hey, our, our tool is fine. That hasn't been the issue. You see from this quote here, the issue is figuring out what we want to get out of the system and how we want to get there. So, so we would propose that getting to New York in this instance is using BI to dramatically change care. How do you get, how do you actually get to that shift in care from the BI uh, tools and solutions that you have? And, and how do you set up to have the driver, if you will, the culture, um, all of these things set up so that you get there? You can picture, if, you, if you're literally picturing a drive, someone with a car that doesn't make it to New York, what are their, what are their reasons going to be? Well, they got busy with other projects at home in North Carolina, and they were cleaning out the garage, or they, uh, you know, grandma called and said, hey, we need to run over to her house, or, you know, you think of the things that would happen. Or, hey, they drove up through Delaware and stopped at the beach and loved being at the beach. You know, you just think of all the things that would get in the way. And most of these organizations are not saying, it is the fault of my tool. So if you go back to what we talked about at the beginning, the more your organization is set up as a, to have change, change agents, the more you're set up with great analysts, the more pressure there will be on that tool to be fantastic. So. I just wanted to share one quote that I thought was fairly representative of what I see at a number of organizations. And this is from a CIO that I would consider very self-aware, um, you know, aware of what they're good at and not good at. And, and we don't always see this, but very much so in this case, they say we're enamored with the data. We just don't know what to do with it. We, we follow the bright, shiny objects. We get excited about the data we can get. We want to put data in front of physicians and feel like they'll change if we can just put the data in front of them. And then this uh, bottom line, we've heard way too often, we just bought a new product and have gotten very little use out of it. So, so I want to hit just a couple of things for a few minutes around um, how we see this, again, how to get, some, how to get more value out of it and, uh, and what kinds of purchases are being made out there. So, so if you take this driving to New York, analogy one step further, there are four key approaches to buying a car that will get you, get you to New York. Um, one of those is to focus on the engine. You want a big, powerful engine that, that will get you through just about anything. And that, we look at as these cross-industry tool set vendors. Very strong engines, can work multiple industries. The real question there is, can you tweak it to do and get you where you need to go? The second is on healthcare only solutions, which we uh, affectionately refer to as our GPS vendors. They know the neighborhoods. They've been there, they know the exact streets, they've, they've traveled through all of these. Um, oftentimes they can show you where there's construction, where there's traffic, um, where a road may be closed. And this is, these vendors know healthcare. They know how to solve the healthcare specific issues, but may not have that uh, heavy duty engine, analytics engine, that you get from those cross-industry tool sets. The next group is, is the EMR vendor BI. And, uh, and that ties specifically to the core vendors that are being sold today, um, where, they, where they will approach and say, hey, we have an analytics tool set, and it's integrated in with our, with our natural EMR. And so you can obviously, you can typically get a, both a price break and an integration setup break by going obviously with your, your EMR vendor. Um, and then, then the last one, we're gonna call the self-driving car, which are these, uh, these vendors that allow you to quickly jump into the tools, a lot of visual data discovery, your clicks and tableaus uh, specifically. So if you use those four as a baseline, I wanna just show some ratings of how providers broadly think about these four groups. Um, so the first one is the percent of the time that customers would say they would buy these again, meaning they had a good enough experience, they wanna keep going down that path. The highest one out of the healthcare 
specific solutions. So ones where they've been down that road before and they know uh, specifics that you can work on. The biggest challenge is around the big tool set solutions. The ones that uh, have historically taken several years, a lot of them from the health system and they just haven't gotten to the finish line, if you will. And, uh, and then I would also say it's interesting to look at the BI that comes from the EMR vendor where it, uh, there's still very much a hit and miss history of these uh, EMR vendors being able to produce there. But, uh, but we'll point out a few other interesting things on that topic here in just the next few slides. Um, when the question is asked, do you have the functionality that you need? So now not just would you do it again, but how good is the functionality? You'll notice that the EMR uh, vendor produced BI is uh, at the bottom of that stack, meaning the, the products are still immature, but they also have the highest optimism as class calculated optimism of who will be able to get there. So you have uh, tools that are maybe less mature today, but the highest optimism from customers that they will be able to get there and move forward to where they need them to be. And I think the one thing we should clarify here, Adam, is uh, for those not familiar with class, we rate on a one to nine scale. So one low, nine high, five neutral right in the middle. So these scores are on a one to nine scale. Yeah, thank you, Bradley. And, and one other thing to, to point out here is you would assume functionality-wise, that the big tool set solutions would be at the far left, that they would likely have the most functionality that, that people need. They have the big engine, if you will. So the, the reality is a lot of these customers feel like they just haven't gotten the guidance, the coaching, the mentoring from these vendors to help make the, the tool sets work. So it's kind of like having a great, uh, a great BMW that, that you know you could zip around on, but you're, you're just doing sort of loop-de-loops in your cul-de-sac. So, uh, and again, some of these are a little bit of overgeneralizations, but they are trends that we're absolutely seeing from the, the purchasers of these solutions. And then, and then lastly, would you buy the solution again? So end of the day, um, would you buy it again? And the, the virtual data discovery clearly leads in this space, meaning, Organizations are saying we are finally getting value from our analytics tools. So these organizations are overwhelmingly letting us know that they are making actual decisions that are changing care, changing costs with these tool sets. And then on, on the far end are these big tool set solutions where organizations are saying, look, as we go make our next purchase, we're going to go a little different direction. And, and, and some of those are keeping their big tool sets and plugging on top. Uh, one of these uh, more specific healthcare solutions or uh, drill down solutions on the top. So let me just hit a couple of summary slides here before we jump into the population health specific uh, data. But essentially, just know there's no single solution that will do it all, nor is the solution the solution. We really strongly believe that it's first the culture it's the, uh, the willingness to change and it's the right people to help drive the change and then uh, last of all the tool set. So, so knowing that, knowing that the quality of the tool set combined with solid coaching is real results, I just wanna show one last slide of where we, how, we're, how class is trying to get to results. So in this quadrant chart, the upper right quadrant is a depiction of those vendors that are giving both proactive guidance and where the providers are getting the most value out of their systems. And there seems to be a, a fairly clear correlation between the amount of coaching and guidance that the, that the vendor gives and the amount of success that providers have on actually getting the better outcomes. And, uh, and Health Catalyst, I know we mentioned before, is one of those that has been the best at the coaching and helping with, with not trying to, to eat the whole elephant, but taking it piece by piece based on where the provider wants to start. And, uh, and you can see in the bottom left corner, you see that uh, a vendor like Oracle is giving the least amount of guidance to their customers. And uh, they're also near the bottom in terms of actually getting better outcomes from the tool set. So with that, let me tag Bradley, who will walk us through some of the population health specific uh, information. So as we think about population health, uh, 
you think about the data that goes into the tool and into the population health tool and one of the things that surprised me a little last year we did a, a perception study and we asked providers and we said what's your biggest gap in population health right now and the providers came back and the the answer was overwhelmingly data data aggregation is our biggest gap that we have right now and that really surprised me because a couple of years ago providers were like oh yeah we got this data aggregation down so what changed well, what changed is instead of just getting data from my electronic medical record and putting that into my population health tool, now I want to get a more complete picture of my patient. I want to bring in claims data as well. I want to bring in pharmacy data and lab data and all these other data sources and put them together. And anybody that deals with data knows that all data is not created equal. And the more data sources that you try and bring in, the harder it is. And this is one of those good examples of not getting ahead of yourself. Um, at class, we get excited to go research the, the next cool area. And, and to us, that would be the engagement with the patient that, you know, how are the tools working for care managers? All of sort of the next generation of exciting tools. Well, as we talk to providers, they're still getting stuck on what good does it do to have great care managers and tools in place for the care managers if we can't have um, all the data we need in one place together for them to work from. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at this chart on the right here, you'll see that on average, the, it, as you increase the number of data sources that you're bringing into your tool, the ease of establishing and maintaining those data feeds decreases. So definitely you can see that general trend that the more data you're trying to bring in, the harder it is. Now, one of the things that that we talked about already that makes this really interesting is we took a look and we said you know how how willing is your vendor to adapt to meet your evolving needs because population health changes population health last year is different than population health was this year and different than it will be next year it, it's something that is ever changing uh, and uh, continues to grow and move at a pace that that is uh, uh, let's say unprecedented but the thing that providers came back and told us that uh, that kind of surprised me they said the thing that makes a big difference for me is having a vendor who is there to help me through my population health journey one that is willing to adapt to meet my evolving needs the tone of those conversations it's better Providers are happier when they have someone that's there. It's almost like having a coach on a basketball team. Rather than just playing around you and the guys on the court, you have someone to direct you and help you and set play, where uh, otherwise you're just setting them by yourself. Plus, it's, it's interesting to look at some of this, even the changes that have happened since we published this, you know, major shifts at the advisory board, turning off some of the pro products that are in this space. Um, uh, you know, you look at a vendor like Athena Health, who you would assume would be one of the highest on the ability to adapt to evolving needs. Well, Athena is, sh is shifting and working through what their population health strategy is. And the original reasons that some of the, these providers bought it are not, does not map to the roadmap today of where Athena is going. So it's really interesting to just see how quickly this chart moves and uh, what it will look like at the end of 2017 is uh it, it will not look like this i guarantee <laughs> i definitely believe you on that adam so one last thing i wanted to talk about with everyone today uh, is what what is population health and that is a question that we got asked we were kind of surprised when when our advisory board said hey we need you to define what population health is and we're, we were kind of floored by that okay uh, well how do we do that and the way that we do it is we get a bunch of smart people together put them in the same room and have them define it uh, and the way that we got this group together and uh, so we pulled together some IT vendors in the population health space as well as some providers that were really smart in the space and we 
we had a straw man that was developed, brought it together uh, at this Keystone Summit and had everyone beat it up. And we came out with a, a definition for population health, what it is. And you'll see here that there's six different layers in population health. And the first two, the aggregation and the analyze layer, that's what we've been talking about today. That's the BI uh, section of population health. It's getting the data together, getting good data, getting the right data, and then analyzing it, stratifying it so that you can understand your patient population, understand the individual patients, and, and then you can help in the rest of these layers. So the care coordination, the financial layer, the patient engagement, and the clinician engagement. So uh, we are, are working this year in our study to validate what's real in the marketplace from these vendors to understand what providers are actually using uh, within these different verticals. Uh, and that's what we are, are pushing to understand this year. And, and, and that will be the really interesting part. We, we actually did a summit on interoperability uh, two years ago, and the level of stress of the vendors that participated was off the charts. So knowing that there was a lot of pressure on them from the federal government, uh, knowing that they were nowhere near where they needed to be on interoperability uh, was just off the charts. With population health, it was, I would say, a more relaxed atmosphere, mostly because there's very little measurement of who's done what so far in the market. So everyone can sort of claim a, a leadership spot. Um, we, we, through our research, have already found it fascinating who's actually doing what, um, what the claims are out in the market versus where people are. Um, let me just give one example. There was a, a vendor who shared a site that had been you know, in theory, or was going to be one of their very best sites, uh, called this customer up and they said, well, it's weird that we're one of their best sites because we just shut the product off last week because it wasn't meeting our needs. We couldn't get, we couldn't get the data into the system. We couldn't get the, the data feeds that we needed. So uh, it is very much the Wild West and there will be huge variances and differences between these, these vendors. And in fact, we're happy to share the findings with any of you uh, provider organizations on the phone when this is uh, released in June. So, so with that, we'll uh, we'll turn it back for uh, for questions. Great, Adam Bradley. Thank you all very much for covering so much uh, ground in a limited amount of time. Uh, we really appreciate it, and I think the uh, members would be very interested in your updated report uh, when that comes out in June. Maybe we can uh, even have you back to talk about it a little bit more. But uh, looking forward to that. As you say, this is uh, um, this is very much a, a, a changing environment. Um, do you all get to the point? It sounds like the answer is uh, is a little complicated. But do you get to the point where you recommend any particular types of solutions? Um, certainly, you know, my takeaway from the presentation was that obviously it depends a lot on the organizations and, and its needs and its capabilities. But um, you, you did seem to have some links. So, so we won't we won't. Uh, we won't act as a consulting firm and recommend a vendor. We will, however, take where a provider is, what they're trying to solve, and share which of these solutions have best met those needs. And you can picture in a, in a population health world, there are ACOs trying to find solutions, there are large physician groups, there are big uh, CINs and big healthcare systems. So for example, if you are, are a large acute care group trying to create your own ACO, um, I2I won the best in class award uh, shared with Enley for population health. I2I only does physician groups. That's all they do. Um, Enley has historically done uh, physician groups and is moving into larger or academic health systems. So there's definitely a fit that goes along with this. We certainly wouldn't just recommend, hey, uh, you know, grab the vendor that's at the top and run with that. But, uh, but we do try to make very much a database, uh, uh, paint the picture of what your life will look like with that vendor um, based on the experience of others. So yes. And along the same lines, and sticking with your last uh, slide on the, the, the population health IT um, core capabilities to support um, uh, success. Uh, are, are some of the vendors um, more uh, attuned to moving in the population health uh, direction than 
others, or again, does it depend on the, uh, the particular organization starting point? So, you know, for example, just to pick up on your last comment, um, you mentioned that, that some are, are focusing in the position group space, others in, in um, other settings, but part of population health is uh, in increasing the uh, effective clinical integration across these settings. Yeah, so it, as we look at population health uh, as a whole, it's kind of like climbing a mountain, if you will. And there are many different paths up the mountain, but the goal is the same, getting to the top. Uh, and so as, as you look at the vendors in the space and how providers are, are tackling population health, there's no one way that's the best for, for everyone. And uh, it's really just a, a game of, okay, we need to get up this mountain. Where are we going to start and who can help us start there? And by the way, it definitely becomes a challenge for class. Let me give one example. So if I'm talking to a health catalyst customer about what they're doing and they're using this, these insights from health catalyst to do population health, are they a BI vendor or a population health tool? And uh, historically, we've broken those two out, and Health Catalyst was be best in class for the business intelligence solutions. Mm -hmm. um, it is becoming very fuzzy between are you a pop health vendor or are you a BI vendor? Now, that's in some cases. If you look at an Oracle, for example, they have remained pretty clearly in the, in the BI space. If you look at IBM, they have a, a very clear offering for BI and then a number of tools for population health that are very specific now to the healthcare world. So you can see those vendors that have made a jump to move to a population health and those that haven't. So like a, a dimensional insight, uh, information builders haven't, haven't uh, really made a switch to move to real uh, population health, although you may see that from some of these vendors in their marketing, they just haven't, haven't made a move to really fine tune their tools to be to be easily used, although, you know, I guess in the broadest sense, you could, could tweak the tools to use them for population health, absolutely. But uh, I think just from what we've learned from these uh, providers that have gone before as pioneers, the more the vendor can help tailor it to that use, uh, they just start so much further ahead. Yeah, that, that is a very clear thing from, from this presentation and your experience. Um, I also wanted to go back to, uh, as you said, uh, this is, something that, that should be viewed as a process that takes some, some time and effort. And uh, it sounds like, is there a, in terms of getting key data together, is there a data strategy that goes along with the, uh, uh, with the uh, um, analytic strategy here? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And as you look at getting the data together, uh, you know, there are some vendors that have a very clear vision of, of how to get that data together and they uh, have a strategy and um, are very prescriptive with the provider. Uh, and there are others uh, that are less so. And, uh, and then there are some provider organizations that have a very clear vision and picture of how they wanna go. And, uh, and just having the, the clear vision of what data you want to get in uh, and not trying to tackle everything at once, but uh, you know, putting in uh, one thing at a time or, or a couple at a time, just so you can have some wins with the solution. Uh, I've seen that be very helpful for providers. And let me add one, one other thing to that. I've, I've seen in talking with many of these health systems, almost everyone feels behind on their data governance, meaning they just, they're trying to figure out how do you do this and what's the best way and how do you, uh, right. how do you get everyone involved that needs to be? So, so almost everyone feels behind. So if you're on this call and feeling behind, you're probably with most of the rest of your peers right on track with where you are. Now, there are a few health systems I've talked to that really are ahead. They have a very clear data governance structure. They have a very clear meeting structure. They have a clear uh, prioritization uh, of how do they actually make the decisions. But, uh, but most organizations I've talked to feel behind on that data governance challenge. 
Are, are those decisions about um, uh, these, these details of data governance that you're just mentioning best done in collaboration with a with a vendor uh, and building it out? Is that something that um, depends on the tool, or is it something that organizations should just focus first on uh, where they think their their biggest data needs are, and then um, uh, consult the, the vendors from there? You know, so what I what I've seen that works the best, and this is not all the time, but generally speaking, is the provider knows where they want to go. They have a few quick wins that they want to tackle, and the vendor helps them with that. I've seen a few cases where the vendor comes in and says, "No, no, we've done this enough. That's not where you want to start." But I've, for for the most part, the vendors haven't been. Uh, that prescriptive. They've been more, hey, let's help you do what you want to do. Um, where we have seen success is though in limiting the number that you want to go after. Because a lot of times there are, are 20 analytics things they're trying to solve. And so they'll jump in to try to solve all 20 when in reality, solve one and solve it quickly and get momentum. Then go solve number two and keep that yeah. momentum going. So so we've seen that the best coaching has been around solving one or two issues and, and building that momentum up versus a two-year project where you're cleaning up in the background and you just never get to uh, real value. Yeah, we've seen that kind of focus strategy of you know having the, the, the big long-term goals in mind but having a, a kind of more feasible uh, stepwise, maybe more incremental in the short term uh, approach uh, for specific steps to help get there. We've seen that in, in other areas of uh, moving forward population health uh, and uh, accountable care success uh, uh, more generally. And this gets back to some of your previous discussion, but um, it sounds like many of the vendors are, are, are willing to engage in this kind of step-by-step, um, -step, you know, build a, a partnership over time approach, or does that work better with some kinds of uh, analytic tools than others? It, it really varies by vendor. Uh, and, uh, you know, generally speaking, I, vendors have different personality types uh, and there are some that are much more more willing to sit alongside you and uh, to be with you in this population health journey so uh, you know as you saw from that chart there's the the willingness to adapt to meet your evolving needs it, and not everybody is uh, you know in the in the seven and above on a one to nine scale yeah and I would add to that there are I am seeing quite a bit of momentum from vendors realizing they need to be more prescriptive, more consultative on this process. Um, and so they are putting together teams, educating teams on how to be more prescriptive and consultative. So we absolutely see that as a trend among, among vendors who haven't really gone that direction before. There are st still probably two or three that I can think of where we've made those strong recommendations and they look at us cross-eyed, like that's just not who we are. We just yeah. we hand the tool set off, and that's what we do at the end of the day. So, so for those vendors, uh, I would not even hardly make the attempt to ask for guidance because that's just not what they do. Um, but they're also the ones who are less likely to to help you be successful based on our data. It's interesting evolution. And just before we wrap up, uh, I did get one more. Uh, question more about the, the policy context. So we started out talking about that a little bit. Uh, anything that you've seen recently and some of the, the new steps that, um, at least relatively recent steps that HHS and CMS have announced on meaningful use as it's part of the new MIPS or MACRA program or uh, the, the legislation that Congress passed late last year, 21st Century Cures, has included some uh, provisions intended to promote data sharing. Anything you're seeing on the policy front that's making uh, the uh, um, use, the, the development and use of analytics uh, to support population health uh, easier or harder? Oh, well, that's really a, a loaded question. Uh, and, you know, what I hear from providers, uh, they say, we, you know, the, the general move to value-based care uh, is one that seems to, uh, it's not going to stop. And as we look for payment reform through MACRA and MIPS, uh, providers are, are sinking their teeth into that. And, uh, you know, 
a lot of them are, are nervous about what's going to happen uh, with the the replace or the rip and replace uh, of the the ACA, uh, but uh, really just uh, it's more of a we'll have to wait and see what really happens uh, in this space. Yeah, so so I haven't seen really a change in direction. You know, agreeing with what Bradley said there. Um, I think everyone feels like, look, we're going to be moving this direction. I have seen a few organizations change their speed. So how fast do they want to attack this? Um, how quickly do they turn on certain programs? Um, uh, you know, actually even a few holding off on buying decisions because they would like to know a little bit more of the direction before they pick a partner. So we are seeing some slowdown in some of the buying because of that, but they feel like the at the end of the day, they still need to move that direction. Just who will help them get there is still a question mark. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that uh, your point uh, um, from a few minutes ago about the uh, importance of breaking down these big challenges into feasible incremental step-by-step -step processes uh, maybe maybe goes along with that too. Um, well, we are uh, about out of time for questions. Um, uh, Adam Bradley, I want to thank you all again for. Uh, the presentation class is uh, clearly providing an uh, important role in, in helping connect providers who are trying to uh, add value and care and move to success in population health with, uh, uh, with with vendors who can effectively support them. And as you described, we're in an evolutionary process on how those relationships work and, and what the vendors are doing as well. So we'll. Uh, look forward to that uh, follow-up uh, report that you mentioned and to hopefully staying in touch about all these issues. But in the meantime, uh, thank you all again for, for the time and, and uh, perspectives that you've provided today. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and, thank you. Uh, let me th thank you guys. And just uh, again, uh, uh, if, you, if you all who are participating in the, the webinar have any further questions or uh, questions about other ACLC activities, uh, you can let us know uh, anytime, That's members at accountablecarelc.org. And uh, we hope to see you in our, hope, to, hope you'll join us on our next webinar and hope you'll continue to work with us on this, uh, all of these efforts related to uh, uh, getting to success in accountable care. Thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day.